Hi, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor Lab on BioArchive. With me, I have David Julius from Uni University of California, San Francisco. David, welcome to Cold Thank Spring you. Harbor. Pleasure to be here. Now, we're, we're here at the, um, uh, the annual symposium, and you're going to be talking later in the meeting about noseception, uh, specifically uh, some work, I understand, on, on the gut and the airways. Um, but before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about sort of general principles of nosoception? So this is like um, sensory receptors for noxious stimuli? Yeah, so nosoception is really the initial process of detecting stimuli that um, cause discomfort or pain or have a capacity to cause tissue injury uh -huh. damage. Uh -huh. And so, you know, when we think of pain, it's a kind of, it's a distinct feeling mm -hmm. from other forms of sensory perception. Is that because it's a different type of receptor or is it integration of signals? What's the Yeah, what's it's the all of those way? things. Uh -huh. I think it's, um, it's a activation of a specific subset of sensory uh -huh. nerve fibers. It's the activation of receptors on those nerve fibers that are tuned to detect certain kinds of stimuli. Uh -huh. And then, you know, like everything else in neuroscience, it's part of the wiring diagram. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <coughs> and, and, and obviously, I mean, you know, one of your incredible contributions was, was work on those receptors. Mm -hmm. So this is the TRIP family, is, yes. that, is yeah, that yeah, correct? Yes, primarily so, the TRIP family. So they're, um, they're ion channels? Yeah, so they're ion channels that are, um, that are not entirely selectively expressed on nociceptors, but primarily expressed there uh -huh. <coughs> uh, and they you know appreciate um, stimuli that uh, that cause discomfort or pain I mean some of them we we use uh, volitionally because we've come to appreciate them like chili peppers and things like that, that uh -huh. you know plant products that activate those channels but their physiological role is to activate the subset of, of primary afferents and nociceptors to alert us to um, to noxious stimuli. Right, so, so I mean they're essentially uh, ligand regulated ion channels? Yeah, they're ligand, re or they're, or they're uh, in the case of the TRIP-V1, the capsaicin receptor, and the uh -huh. TRIP-MA channels are also activated by physical stimuli, in this uh -huh. case changes in ambient temperature. Oh, uh, okay, and how does that, I mean you, you mentioned kind of, you know, a, a sort of pleasurable stimuli mm -hmm. like, um, you think of the wasabi receptor, yeah, what's yeah. the relationship between something that seems like it's hot and something that actually is hot? Uh, well, the relationship is a direct, um, you know, biophysical relationship, uh -huh. that one's activating the same ionophore uh -huh. and depolarizing the same subset of neurons, whether you uh, experience a chemical that conveys that um, a, a, a mimic of the psychophysical uh -huh. experience or the temperature itself. Of course, there are differences and you can distinguish them uh -huh. because of how the stimulus is presented. Right. And maybe the efficacy of the stimulus itself. I mean, capsaicin is a very efficacious activator of the channel. Right. But some people say, well, we enjoy capsaicin. How, you know, why is, how is that a pain receptor? And, you know, that's something that we've learned to appreciate. Well, for some people, it's, it's still very noxious. Uh -huh. But what I always say is that if you chop a hot chili pepper and stick your finger in your eye, that's not enjoyable. That's pure pain. Right, <laughs> and right, so, right. Uh, yeah. And, and so... Um, you know, plants have evolved chemicals to, to activate these things as a way, presumably, of guarding themselves against predators. Mm -hmm. um, and some insects and, and other animals do that by making toxins that target the same receptors and the same cell types. But basically what they're doing is activating this pathway in the nervous system that signals discomfort or pain. Right, yeah. Well, as a, as a chronic back pain sufferer mm -hmm. who uses capsaicin, um, uh -huh. I, yeah, I'm, I'm forever grateful for that particular <laughs> uh, signaling mechanism. Now, um, when you talk later in the meeting, you're talking about a very sort of specific instance, which is in, in, in the gut. Right. So what's, yeah. um, and, and, and you've been using, you've got a new model, is that right? Yeah, so this, so what I'll be talking about uh, at this meeting is, is really mostly about the airways, but you're uh -huh. right, it's related to uh, to what we work on in the gut, and I would say, you know, under the rubric of what we would call visceral nociception or visceral okay. pain. So this meeting, uh, of course, as you know, is about more about uh, interoception yeah. and brain-body communication, and of course, all the pain is about brain-body communication. But in terms of interoception, it's it's feeling pain from within, uh -huh. from uh, mostly visceral targets like the gut, the airways, um, you know, other kinds of internal organs, bladder. Et cetera. Uh -huh. and, um, and so <clears throat> we've been working in that area for a few years. Uh, why do we choose these targets? Uh, I think the one where we spent more time working on, we'll continue to do that, is really the gut. Uh -huh. and, and the gut is a very interesting place to work. Well, first of all, first and foremost, in terms of pain, uh, 
and its relationship to people's experience. GI pain is a very prevalent type of yeah, pain. Yeah, and there are a lot of nerves there. There's a lot of nerves. Um, there are a lot of syndromes that mm -hmm. are associated with pain, like IBD and IBS, irritable yeah. bowel syndrome. Uh, and, um, and, there is a, and, and so there's a lot of um, clinical relevance. Uh, aside from that, it's you know, biologically a fascinating process because yeah. the, there are nerve fibers in the gut, but, uh, and they're intrinsically sensitive to certain types of noxious stimuli, but they also collaborate with interesting cell types within the gut. Right. So there's a lot of interesting biology about how different cells within the gut microenvironment communicate. And then, of course, there's the interaction with products of the microbiome or products mm -hmm. of inflammatory cells. So there's a lot of neurochemistry going on there. There's a lot of plasticity. Uh, right. And there's a lot to understand in terms of cell-cell interactions and communications. And, and you've got, uh, I guess you've got an interaction with sort of normal stuff that's continually going on with a specific rhythm and the, those Correct. kinds of yeah, responses. Correct, yeah, in terms of um, and stuff modulating peristalsis using. and things like that. Right. Yeah, and then of course, that's right, the gut is also, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting place to study the interaction between the environment and your body uh -huh. because there's stuff passing through all the time that you eat or yeah. that you know, happens through infection. And so, you know, the gut's like the largest surface area in your body. It's larger than your somatotopic surface. So uh, there's all this stuff going. So it's, it, it, and the airway's sort of the similar thing in a sense uh -huh. that this is, these are organs where, tissues where you're experiencing the interaction between the environment and environmental toxins and other kinds of things, bacteria, uh -huh. microbes, uh, and your internal state. Uh -huh. There's something else that's very interesting about the gut. Uh, that um, that's actually one of the so this is the one area where I've collaborated with my wife Holly Ingram uh -huh. on these things and uh, but it sort of um, exemplifies why this is an interesting area because she's interested in you know female physiology and women's mm -hmm. health and a lot of syndromes that affect the GI tract are most prevalent in women and uh -huh. particularly women in their reproductive ages and so there's some really interesting biology in terms of um, reproductive hormones and sex differences that affect oh, the see, gut and GI pain. And uh -huh. so that's not only a really, so whenever I give a talk on this subject, uh, almost always uh, someone will raise their hands. It's, it's almost always a, a woman in, you know, sort of early to, you know, midlife who says, you know, I have suffered from uh, IB, IBS or, mm -hmm. you know, other such things um, related to that in my life. And I'm really glad someone's working on this. This is a really, very prevalent problem and a uh -huh. really important one. I mean, it affects men as well, yeah. uh, but primarily women. And from a biological point of view, there's some really fascinating questions that come up as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, in your in your in your abstract, you you pointed specifically to neuroendocrine yeah. cells, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, you mentioned hormones. Right. That so, w what's what's their role in this process? So, uh, you know, in the gut, you have uh, these miles of. Um, you know, it's ba basically the, the separation between the lumen, where all the foodstuffs go through mm -hmm. and where the bacteria live, and the, the, the mucosal layer, where there's all the musculature and the intrinsic neural network, yeah. uh, is basically a uni, uh, is a, is a one-cell deep layer of, of epithelial cells that separate yeah. those two compartments. And most of those cells, the enterocytes, are involved in, uh, you know, nutrient uptake and, and mm -hmm. water absorption and all that kind of stuff. But there's a, uh, among those is a rare population of cells, like one to five percent, that are actually excitable, that uh -huh. are neuroendocrine in origin, that are sort of like neurons, and they release a lot of peptides, like GLP-1 and things like right. that, but they also release other transmitters like serotonin and uh, ATP, et cetera. And, um, and what, what we've worked on is the communication between those cells and the sensory nerve endings that come into the gut, from uh -huh. like spinal afferents, for example, the ones involved in pain sensation or for vagal. And so we're really interested in that neurochemistry. What we're finding out is that those interactions are pretty critical in the nociceptive circuit. That right. the communication between these... So that's some, reg they're regulating it, are they? They're, well, uh, the, in, in this case, some of those neuroendocrine cells are actually initiating the signal. signal. They're oh, detecting right. the stimuli. The nerve fibers themselves can detect stimuli as well. Right. But the, these, in, in particular, we're talking about this one cell type called an enterochromaffin cell. Mm -hmm. It's a cell that produces almost all the serotonin in your body, at least peripheral yeah. serotonin. And it's sort of shaping up to be kind of an interesting integrator of noxious stimuli. And so okay. it appreciates uh, various noxious stimuli like bacterial short-chain fatty acids, uh, other things that get made in the gut, and convey that information to sensory neurons that then 
So it, does, that does that make these cells in some ways analogous to the sort of primary sensor receptors yeah. that you have in other Exactly. Other sensors, yeah, so, right? it's, it's, so you know in the skin, and this is a point that I'll make in my yeah. lecture, we think about the so-called C fibers and nociceptors as being these bare nerve endings, you know, very different from what David Ginty talked about the other day mm -hmm. for light touch receptors where the receptor, where the nerve fiber is part of this beautiful organelle like a Virginian corpuscle and that, that's really part of the whole sensory apparatus in the skin. You know, there's always been this idea that the, the, the so-called C-fibers, the unmyelinated fibers that constitute most of the nociceptors, yeah. are acting on their own. You know, they're just bare nerve fibers. I mean, they probably do communicate with keratinocytes, but they're, that's, they're really the site of, of, of where, uh, stimulus detection and integration. Yeah. <coughs> um, but in the gut, in, at least in, in these instances that we've looked at, you're right, it's, it's more like other sensory systems like in the retina or in the nose where there's a primary sensory epithelial type cell Which is and then that communicates the to the innovating nerve right. fiber. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, the, but the, in the gut is probably a combination of both of those things because uh -huh. the nerve fibers themselves can detect mechanical or chemical stimuli or thermal stimuli um, but a, a lot of what they're detecting is in collaboration with these um, specialized right. sensory right. epithelial cells. And in your, um, I was looking in your um, recent bioarchive paper, you, used, you identified two separate serotonin signals. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, in term, oh, in terms of... Um, it was like a, to a tonic one and a... Oh, yes, I see, one yeah. I so one of the questions in the gut field has always been like, uh, you know, what are th what's the dynamics of neurotransmitter mm -hmm. uh, spread and activation, especially for someone like, something like serotonin? And... Um, you know, the, the, the classic view, which is probably true to a large extent, is that these enterendocrine cells, for example, uh, enterochromaffin cells, release serotonin and then it diffuses over a long distance uh -huh. or over a distance to recruit, to activate cell types, uh, yeah. you know, uh, over time and over space. Um, but, you know, we've noticed that some of these sensory nerve endings come rather close to the cells, and so we've always wondered if there's a very close synaptic interaction. Oh, okay. Um, I would say that probably uh, from this study, most of the action is through the sort of diffuse mechanism, but it still leaves questions open about what happens when the transmitter spreads and what are the dynamics and what does that mean for the types of stimuli that have to, that activate cells uh, like these enterochromaffin cells that are, for, for example, in protected crypt regions versus villi, and uh -huh. where are the sensory n uh, endings in those in that sort of very elaborate architecture of the gut, and when are they being activated? Like, so some of the receptors, for example, that get activated by serotonin are fairly low affinity, like ligand-gated uh -huh. ion channels, like 5-HG receptors on on the primary afferents. Does when and, and under what circumstances does the concentration of serotonin within the folds of the gut get to be at those concentrations to activate those receptors as opposed to other serotonin receptors on the epithelium that are involved in things like um, ion transport, et cetera. Uh -huh. So, you know, what's the spatial dynamics of neurotransmitter release? When and how and under what stimulus circumstances does that recruit primary afferents that are involved in pain sensation? And uh -huh. so this study is really about trying to determine what kinds of physical damage or other um, challenges to the gut lead to the release of serotonin in a way that's going to recruit primary afferents that are involved in pain okay. sensation. So that, does, does that tie it into these kind of discussions about what's happening in um, IBD and these other Yeah, um, exactly. Conditions? And so when you have sensitization and when there is pain hypersensitivity, is the dynamics being changed? Um, is the structure of the, uh, or the location of these EC cells within the epithelium changing, and how does that change the dynamics of, of neurotransmitter signaling within the architecture of the mm -hmm. gut? So that's, that's one question. Um, and, uh, and, and is there a difference, for example, in males versus females uh -huh. in, in those kind of signaling scenarios? And, and <clears throat> one of the uh, you know, things we've tried to do in that regard is to generate models in mice that um, that will approximate um, or replicate to some degree uh, persistent pain syndromes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, currently some of the models that people use are uh, to induce a very fulminant inflammatory episode in the, in the gut. That would, for example, might mirror what happens when you get a, a really bad case of food poisoning. Right. 
and then that resolves, the inflammation resolves. And, and so food poisoning, for example, is one of the biggest instigators of, uh, of irritable bowel syndrome. Right. right. And then you're left with pain, could be for months or for the rest of your life, even after. And persistent inflammation. Persist right, yeah. Even after the initial signs mm -hmm. of inflammation and tissue damage from the bacterial infection are gone. Have, have gone right. And so what we've tried to do is to create models that um, that mirror that kind of long-term sensitivity without having all of the tissue destruction and other types of sequelae that right. would normally accompany oh, that. And so we've tried to use genetic models in which we activate uh, these enterchromaffin cells persistently mm -hmm. uh, and see if that generates a persistent pain uh, syndrome. So we can really sort of narrow the really action down it. to this one circuit. And, yeah. and that's turned out to be the case. We can recapitulate some of this longer term. We don't know how long it lasts, but... Uh -huh. The goal, anyway, is to recapitulate the behavioral and physiological manifestations of persistent pain um, without having to uh, initiate a, a, you know, a, a tissue damaging scenario so yeah. that we can really focus on what's happening in those circuits and ask what kinds of long-term molecular changes are happening in things like dynamics of serotonin release or spatial release or, <clears throat> or the uh, geometry and the mm -hmm. neurocircuitry <coughs> or the neuroanatomy of what's happening within those regions of the gut that are affected. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a, it, it's a huge problem within society, pain, chronic pain, mm -hmm. um, IBD, all yeah. those associated conditions. So it's obviously um, important work and um, we wish, wish you luck with that. It's been great talking yeah, to you. Thank, thank you, very, you very, much. very much. I'm glad to be at this meeting. It's um, learning a lot. Great, well, thank I hope you. you enjoy the rest of it. Thanks. Thanks.